see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Okay. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with Nadine Dolby. And Nadine is uh, from uh, Purdue University in the Department of Curriculum and Instructions in the College of Education. And you've just written this book, uh, Rethinking Multicultural Education for the Next Generation, the New Empathy and Social Justice. So thanks for uh, joining me for this uh, dialogue about how can we build a culture of empathy. Thanks, Edwin. The first thing I wanted to do is to thank you so much for the website and all the work you do. Um, because when I was writing the book, your website was very much a partner. And what I was doing, it was feeding me constantly all the new research. Um, and it also it was just giving me a lot of inspiration on a daily basis to keep going and to feel like the work was important. So I really want to thank you for you know, all the effort that you put into that. It's an amazing resource for people. Uh, well, thanks uh, for mentioning that, Nadine. But, and also, I want to say that your, your book was a real inspiration to me. Um, just the way you, you laid out uh, kind of the problem we have in education. You're talking specifically about mm -hmm. multicultural education, mm -hmm. but it, I think it, it transcends multicultural education to the to maybe uh, progressive thought in general and society in general. So I think it it's it, it's a great it's it, I just really enjoyed uh, kind of how you laid everything out and kind of. Uh, explained you know all the things that you were explaining about how multiculturalism is working or not working so uh, thank you for this I'm real, so I'm very excited to talk to you about uh, this work so uh, so what we wanted to do was talk about how we can build a culture of empathy and uh, just kind of ideas that you have and maybe we can start with you know what is the existing problem uh, that we have okay well you know I, I, I agree that there's larger picture there. Um, what I did with this book is I started with where I am and the place where I can start to make a change and have some sort of impact. I've been, I'm a professor at Purdue University and I've been working in the field of teacher education for over 20 years at this point. Um, my work has been in the United States and in Australia and in South Africa. And most of what I have focused on is multicultural education. Um, and the vast majority of students who want to be teachers in the United States and in many other countries around the world have to take a course called multicultural education. It's called different things at different institutions, um, but our national accreditors require some sort of multicultural education course. So if you have a child who's in a school somewhere in a public school in the United States, it's most likely that your child's teacher went through a course that's very similar to the type of course that I teach. And I've become increasingly concerned that the way that we approach this course um, and multicultural education is not a good fit for our students. It's not a good fit for our times. Um, at the same time, I think many of people who follow this website know about all the problems in the larger field of education. Um, we're in this era of an obsession with testing and with assessment. And so our schools have become sort of testing centers. Um, you talk to people who work in the field, you talk to my colleagues who are out in schools every day, and all schools focus on is passing the test and preparing for the test and teaching skills for the test. We've lost any sense that we had of schools and education serving a larger purpose, serving um, humanity, serving the planet, serving the needs of people in a larger way with our obsession with the test. And as a professor who's worked in this field for a very long time, and as a parent, I have a four-year-old, almost five-year-old daughter, I'm very concerned about this culture. And this book felt to me like one way that I could intervene bringing my experience and the book weaves in a lot of my personal experience both in teaching, uh, it weaves in my undergraduate experience as a student in Howard Zinn's class and he was an incredible inspiration to me and to many others. It weaves in some of the experiences I've had in Haiti. It weaves in my um, experiences as a local animal shelter and it talks about 
bringing my personal experience, bringing my academic background in the area together to try to think about how do we do this differently? How do we do education writ large differently? What do we need to do to reshape the American educational system? And then what do we do as teacher educators? What, what's most distressing to me is that there are very few people within education talking about empathy. Um, you can scan the literature and you will see very little out there. Uh, Nell Noddings is well known for her work on caring, and I, maybe you've interviewed her previously. Um, she's well known for her work on caring. I know she's moving a little bit closer to empathy. Um, her work has had minimal influence, some, but not a whole lot. I, I'm talking about the need for a large scale shift in education and the way that we think about schools in our society. And as teacher educators, the way that we educate our our pre serve what we call pre-service teachers, the people who are going to become teachers very soon. Um, so this to me is very important work as a faculty member. It's important work as a parent to do something from the, where I sit to try to make some change and to get a conversation going in education about empathy, one that's absent. I think that if you go through a teacher education program in this country, you probably will never hear the word empathy. Um, and you probably will never hear any word like it. You won't hear sympathy, you won't hear compassion, you won't hear anything like that. Uh, you will hear a lot of work around, you'll hear a lot of discourse around getting students to teach to pass the test. You'll get a lot of, you'll hear a lot about writing lesson plans. You'll hear a lot about content, but you will not hear anything about the human beings who you're going to go into a classroom with in just a matter of years. Um, and how you, you are going to interact with them and how that is going to shape the way they see their lives and see their future. So that's where the book comes from. Um, a, a real desire to try to make, to get a conversation going about what changes we need in education in this country and larger than this country, but starting here. Yeah, so uh, as I've asked people about how do we build a culture of empathy, something that's come up is we need to start a dialogue around it. Mm -hmm. And it's just talking, kind of like what you and I are doing right now and get the largest society and, and educators mm -hmm. to talk about. So it sounds like that's something you're trying to stimulate is that dialogue. It, it is. And I know there are a lot of other people doing this sort of work. They're not really part of the education establishment. There's programs such as the Roots of Empathy. There's Educators for Social Responsibility. There's Facing History our, in Ourselves, which I've known about for a long time, having grown up in the Boston area. Um, and these are all wonderful programs, but I would probably think that 90 to 95 percent of faculty don't know about these programs. And if they did, really wouldn't see how they fit into the larger scheme of education. So I, I'm sitting sort of within an institutional structure as opposed to in a nonprofit organization. So I'm trying to see how to get a conversation going within the institutional structure. There are some people, for example, um, Ken Cushamero has done some work on empathy. Gloria Ladson Billings, who's very well known in education, started some very important work on empathy 20 years ago. But that was before the new research on empathy that really looked at it more as something that is biological and neurological and available to all people as opposed to seeing it as a moral discourse um, and an aesthetic discourse. That's where empathy has really come in in education. And I'm trying to broaden that conversation. I'm trying to bring all this new research in neuroscience and primatology and cognitive ethology to educators to say, there is a different way, there is a different path. We don't have to do things the way we've been doing. They're grounded in misunderstandings about human nature, about animal nature, about the relationship between people and animals and the environment. And we need to start a different, a different conversation. The, the responses in education have been primarily um, either try to go along and hope this goes away soon, you know, go along with the testing, do the best you can and hope this all goes away soon, or critique it. And, and we need both of those things because there are real children and real schools being affected right now by what's happening. I mean, as I speak, they're being affected right now by what's happening in this country and the focus that's going on. And we need critique because that's very important. But I'm also suggesting in addition to those two things, as educators, we need to start a dialogue that begins on a different plane, that starts to move this conversation forward in a new way. And so that's what I'm trying to do with the book. Um, and bringing these things together to say to educators, 
we had one conversation for the past 30 or 40 years. It's time for a different one. So you lay in, in your book, you laid out the existing uh, constellation of values that have been there in the uh, multicultural uh, education field. There's uh, this whole notion of privilege was one that kind of sticks out to me and, and there's others. So you're kind of like taking, you were in, in the first, I think two chapters or three chapters, you kind of laid out what the existing uh, situation is in education. And then you started moving uh, to, to the next, like why empathy should be uh, right. the next step. So right. what is that constellation? Uh, the one uh, the, the, about uh, a privilege, I just was at a, a interfaith uh, gathering that was related to interfaith and uh, the Occupy movement. Mm -hmm. and, and I saw it c come up there. I saw the the uh the notion of uh privilege come up and and you could just see how it was the that community was kind of steeped in that uh in in those in that understanding and it was like um and i tried to bring in empathy i said no we need to uh you know uh we need to take the next step towards empathy and it was i, was, I got really a lot of resistance to mm -hmm. it so yeah, I mean, and, and that's true. And I think we need to distinguish between a, a number of things when we talk about privilege. It's not as if white privilege doesn't exist in this country. It, it does exist. And I, I see that every day. I have an African American daughter, I mean, and, and a husband who is black. So I fully understand the way the white privilege works. I, I think the problem is that when we try to do it in classrooms and we try to create pedagogies around white privilege, solely white privilege, our students who are predominantly white and middle class and have never thought about these issues before resist us and they shut us down. And they just say to us, okay, I'll listen to you for 15 weeks and then I'm just gonna get my grade and I'm gonna move on. Um, and that pedagogically is not very helpful. Our, our students don't understand white privilege because they don't have, they're not getting in their schools, they're not getting history anymore. Most of my students couldn't tell you anything about the civil rights movement. Um, they're not getting history anymore, they're get, not getting context. They think everything is just fine in this country. We, we know that's not true. But we're sitting within a situation where within 15 weeks, we can't do all of that for our students. We cannot make up for the gaps in 12 years of American education. And so when we start talking about these things as if they know they don't know, um, and thus they resist us, and thus we don't really get much movement out of them within 15 weeks. I think there's also a lot of fascinating research coming out of social psychology that indicates that if your empathy is not developed at an early age, that um, your capacity to develop it later becomes much more difficult. So for example, if you are a white male in this society, you don't have to develop as much empathy as somebody who is not as privileged. Now some, some white men certainly do, but many don't. Um, and they don't because of the structures of our society. But that's because, it's not because they're not capable of it. It's simply because our society has been structured in a certain way and they're socialized in a certain way. So we get these students, they're 18, 19, 20 years old. They've never had the experience of empathy. They've never had the experience of trying to listen to somebody else and stop talking and thinking about themselves for a minute. And in 15 weeks, it's just impossible to move them from, from empathy to in, what I call informed empathy, drawing on Deborah Meyer's work, to social justice. It's, it's too big. It's a very slow process. But my feeling is we need to reverse it. What we do is we try to dump white privilege on students, and then they just resist it. They shut, it, they shut us down, and they move on with their lives. They've learned nothing. I'm not saying we shouldn't get to white privilege and justice eventually because that's the end goal. For me, that's the end goal. But we need to start with empathy and we need to start with understanding that, that many of our students have never been exposed to empathy. One of the things I did for this book is I gave a survey out to about 400 students that um, were in my multicultural education course that semester. And 
most of them had no understanding of empathy except among their friends and their family. Except for that, it was sympathy. They could pity other people. They could have, um, they could want to help other people, but they weren't really in a place of being able to listen to other people from their perspective and understand that some of the things they wanted to do to help other people may actually harm other people. And that, so to me, the empathy's got to be the first step. And we move people from starting with empathy um, as a step towards social justice. So I wouldn't say we get rid of privilege and we get rid of right privilege as a construct, but we understand that pedagogically it doesn't work. And we need to start with empathy. We haven't had empathy for our students, for the students in our own classes. And that's a huge problem because we haven't been able to listen to and understand where they are at and work with them to move them forward. I think some of the work coming out of social psychology is helping us, like coming out of the Greater Good Society um, at Stanford and you know University of California, Berkeley. I think some of that is starting to help us because it's really giving us some good experimental and beyond anecdotal evidence that yes, it's true. If you are from a less privileged position, you do develop more empathy in your life because you've had to. You've had to listen to other people. You've had to be able to see things from their perspective. Um, and if you are from a more privileged position, you haven't had to do that. And so we have to have empathy and understanding for that lack of life experience put ourselves in that position and work with that. Um, one of the things I talk about in the book that I do with my teaching team, which is uh, four, to, four to seven graduate students who actually teach the class, is we try to go back and read some of the essays that we wrote as undergraduates. And what we find is that some of the things we wrote as undergraduates when we were 18 and 19 years old are really appalling. And we wouldn't agree with them today. But that's where we were and that's where our students are. And I think it's very easy to forget because we have a lot more life experience than our students. We just have this plethora of ways of looking at the world that they don't have. And so going back and reading those essays can be a very humbling experience. Um, one of the things I did to write the book is I had the journals that I kept for Howard Zinn's class and I went back and I read all of those to try to understand how I was thinking as an 18 and 19 year old. And that was very helpful because it got me back into that perspective and into that moment before I really understood and had this commitment to social justice. And then I could see my own path. And by, by seeing my own path, it makes it easier to help others. Um, I, I'm going to go back to the uh, privilege again. Sorry about this, because sure. um, at that event that I went to, uh, it came up all the time. And then they were passing around the microphone. And it was a minister came to me and uh, said, oh, you're a white male. We're going to give it to somebody else. So, I mean, I, I was like outraged at that. And I said, what's going on here? So what I, so I've kind of seen that in other kind of workshops and so forth about this whole privilege that it, as, a, as a white male, I felt kind of like judged. And it's like, I don't know, it's just... Um, it seemed to me that kind of an empathic approach would have been, okay, we're here to listen to everyone and to see everyone and hear everyone. And so, I don't know, it's just uh, that whole kind of notion about privilege. Um, maybe I'm kind of just wanting to kind of explore that a little bit because it seems to be a large part of the multicultural um, you know, education part. And I'm just kind of wondering what you think about that. Yeah, it is a large part. And, and again, I think that we need to recognize historically that context. Um, but at some point, we do have to also move beyond that context. Um, so it's, I think it's a very difficult juggling act. I'm, I'm in no way saying that the multicultural field needs to eliminate the paradigm of white privilege but or the idea of privilege in general, because there are pieces that are incredibly true and they resonate for me every single day um, in my own life and in my professional life. At the same time, I think when we're in the classroom and we're trying to teach students, it's not very helpful as a first sort of cut at trying to get students committed to social justice because it's not um, empathic at all. It does not understand where they're coming from. It doesn't take into account this really compelling research that shows that empathy has to be developed at, at, at an earlier age. 
um, and we can't. It's very difficult to start with students who are 18 and 19. So I'm not trying to reject that. I'm trying to say we need to do something different in terms of pedagogically, because we just don't have the time. Um, and if students shut us off at week one or week two, because what we're coming in with is the exact so sort of thing that you experienced at this gathering, then, then all is sort of lost. We've lost those students. And they're still going to be teachers. They're still going to get out of our programs and they're still going to be teachers. But we've lost any possibility we've had to develop empathy. Um, and I think it's compounded by the fact that within colleges of education, the sorts of classes that I'm teaching are becoming more and more marginalized because there's this focus on content in order to pass the test and less of a focus on classes that are considered pedagogy, which are my classes. Um, for example, we just were reviewed by the Department of Education here in the state of Indiana. And the, the classes that I teach and many of the classes like the courses I teach, Obviously, a lot of what you do is you reflect on your own personal experience, your own autobiography as a way of coming to a more understanding about yourself and thus being able to understand others better and your relationships with others and how those relationships are sort of situated historically and politically and culturally and socially. So yes, writing autobiographies and reflections are part of what we do. And that was criticized quite heavily by the State um, Department of Education here in Indiana because they said that, that there's no connection between reflection or autobiography and teacher effectiveness. Now, teacher effectiveness just means getting kids to do better on the test. Uh, it, it doesn't mean anything more than that. So you see, we've really moved away from any sort of sense of education as with any kind of humanistic base. And we really moved towards within teacher education programs and then flowing into schools, an emphasis that really takes away any sort of time for anything that's not testing. Um, you probably remember the case of Phoebe Prince, uh, the 15-year-old the student in South Hadley. She was a uh, an Irish immigrant and she um, committed suicide? Uh, I didn't know that story. Okay, um, so she, this was uh, January 2010, and she had just arrived from Ireland, probably been in the school at South Hadley High School about six months, and she was bullied. She was pretty much bullied to death. Her mother was on Piers Morgan, um, on the CNN show Piers Morgan, just last November. And she was talking about the culture in the school and the way that the culture of the school had no time for Phoebe. It appears that the teachers and the administrators knew how serious the bullying was. They knew what was going on. Phoebe went to the it went to the teacher. She went to the principal. She went to the vice principal. And she was she was told point blank. There's no time for this. Go back to class. Um, and I think that speaks volumes to where our schools are at. There is no time for this. There is no time for anything that is not about filling out a Scantron. And that is what, you know, in a larger frame needs to shift. It's mm. very difficult in a college of education because there's a huge amount of pressure on faculty to bring in money, to get grants, to do work that's related to what we call STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, much of this is driven by the Obama administration and the Arnie Duncan's race to the top, which is really just, uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen the film Race to Nowhere, mm -hmm. a race to nowhere or a race to destruction. So all these forces sort of come together to put the focus on money and competition and testing and further and further away from building the cultural culture of empathy that you're interested in. Yeah. So what what you're saying is is there's a the school system has really kind of been restructured around competition. You have to compete to take these tests and to score high on on the tests. And all and there's just because of that uh, competition, that gearing towards the test, there's no time for hearing for empathizing with the students, for the teachers to empathize with the students more deeply, uh, for the uh, students to empathize with each other, and for empathy to kind of be valued within that system. Yeah, I mean, that's correct. And we can see the rise in um, cases of student bullying, student suicides. There have been two youth suicides right in my county within the past week. 
I don't know if they were re connected to bullying, but I would not be surprised to find out that they are. Uh, when I meet with my graduate students, they're talking about cases of teacher bullying. The teacher is actually doing the bullying. So not just the students or the teachers participating in the bullying or the teachers not stopping the bullying because again teachers don't have this as part of their education to become teachers and thus they go into the classroom with a very narrow sense of what it is to be a teacher not an expansive sense um, and that is what they do in the classroom because that is what they know that's what they've been taught because nowhere in their education did anybody talk about empathy did anyone talk about compassion about care about any of these things. So my work is trying to work with students who are going to become teachers to try to see how do we move their feelings of sympathy. They have a lot of sympathy. Um, and that sympathy can really get in the way because a lot of times the, the sympathy manifests itself as a caring that actually hurts people. Uh, for example, you know, white students who believe that African American students can't learn. Um, and so maybe they pity them because they can't learn, because they think they can't learn. But that obviously in the long run hurts those children, hurts those families, hurts our community. So sympathy can be very dangerous because sympathy can, in sympathy people focus on themselves and what their, their views and their perspectives. And, and they don't really take into account the larger context. They don't take into account the way other people see and experience the world. So you're really making a distinction between empathy and sympathy, and uh, would you like to go in into more? Like, how do you see that difference? Uh, you know, what what what's happening when we empathize versus when we uh, sympathize? Sure. I mean, in the book, I talk about. Uh, I think it's a section called "Toys for Haiti." So uh, my husband and I adopted our daughter from an orphanage in Haiti um, about two and a half years ago. And during the process of her adoption, Haitian adoptions take a very long time. We travel to Haiti several times to visit her. The children come out of the orphanage. They stay at the hotel with the parents. During that time, we did spend a little time in Haiti, sort of, you know, outside of the hotel and outside of the orphanage. And we also got to get into the orphanage and see what the orphanage is like. And to someone coming from the United States, and I've traveled quite a bit, so I've seen a lot of poverty, I've seen a lot of devastation, but Haiti really is something that is in its own league in terms of the scale and the way that it affects you emotionally when you're there. Um, because it's one of the poorest countries in the world, and even if you have experienced in poverty elsewhere, I don't think anything really prepared you for Haiti. So we go into the orphanage and, you know, the baby cribs are just in, it's just one little room. It's probably no bigger than your living room, if, assuming you have sort of a, you know, a regular sort of middle class American living room. And there's cribs just one on top of each other stacked, you know, 30, 40 babies in one room in these cribs. And you, you just are sort of overwhelmed with what do you do? And you have this natural inclination towards sympathy, towards wanting to do something. Um, and so one of the things I did when I got back to the United States while we were sort of in between trips and doing paperwork and waiting for our daughter is I did some toy drives and some drives to just get supplies to send to, to bring back with me to Haiti to take down to Haiti the next time I went to visit because um, that's the easiest way to get things down there this was before the earthquake the easiest way to get things down there was simply to put them in your suitcase and pay the excess luggage and just take them yourself Shipping really is not a good a good option there. So I did some local drives and you know people give you things that make no sense in Haiti. Uh, for example, people gave me long sleeved fleece pajamas. Um, you don't need that in Haiti. It's very warm there. You, you just don't. Um, people would give me a bottle of vitamins that they had opened and was half half used. They gave me tubes of toothpaste that they had opened and half used. Um, somebody gave me just, it appears just like all the broken pieces from her children's toys and put them in a bag with the feeling that, well, if you have nothing, then broken pieces of plastic are better than nothing. Um, that's a sympathy perspective. 
because that really think just focuses on you and what you want to do and making you feel good. And maybe it does make you feel good to say, you know what, I'm not going to use the rest of this bottle of vitamins. I'll give it to people in Haiti. Um, but obviously, I couldn't do anything with that. And a lot of these things that I collected ended up in my trash, in my recycling, or ended up going to Goodwill. So when I worked with a group of students locally who were doing a, uh, they wanted to send toys to Haiti, I developed a list, which I have in the book, which gives you a sense of what it means to move from sympathy for Haitian children to empathy for Haitian children. And let me just give you a, a couple examples. One thing is don't send toys that need batteries. Um, it sort of seems to be common sense that in an orphanage environment, a toy with a battery is going to run down very quickly and need to be replaced. And they don't have any more batteries. And then the question becomes, what do you do with the battery when you take it out of the toy? Well, there's no recycling there for batteries. So all that happens is that all these batteries you send with the toys just contribute to the environmental waste in Haiti. Same thing with packaging. Don't send packaging. There's nowhere to recycle it. It just ends up piled up on the streets of Port-au-Prince, um, just adding to the problems. Stuffed animals. Don't send stuffed animals. Why? Because you can't keep them clean in an orphanage environment. They don't have washing facilities. The washing facilities they do have need to be used for diapers. Um, which obviously are a huge sort of, you know, disease and contamination issue in that environment. Um, a stuffed animal, one child puts it in their mouth, the next child puts it in their mouth, and the whole orphanage is sick. Um, so you, again, thinking about what happens on the other end. Don't send toys with all sorts of small pieces because small pieces are choking hazards, obviously, for young children. In an orphanage environment, it's difficult to separate out toys and say these are for the five-year-olds and these are for the two-year-olds because that's just not the reality of how the interactions happen there. Um, and so if a, a toy comes in with lots of small parts, of course the orphanage staff are not going to give those to the children because it's a danger, just like it's a danger to your children. So there are pieces that I talk about in the book of trying to get the students to work with their natural inclination for sympathy and try to get them to move a little bit to see what it's like to actually get those toys on the other end. And if those toys make sense for those children. If you send books, English language, storybooks, there's nobody there who can read them. Um, because the, only a couple people there speak English. It's mostly the directors. The nannies probably have literacy and absolutely no language. They probably can't even read Creole. Um, and there's nobody there to read those books. So it's beginning to work with the students. And that's the step to social justice. I mean, the step is working with sympathy, saying, yeah, these students want to do something. I'm going to work with them. Trying to get them to move to more of an informed empathy. And then getting them to ask the more difficult questions about Haiti, about why is it in the situation it's in? Um, why are there 10,000 plus NGOs, non-governmental organizations in Haiti. Ask those difficult questions. What about the history of Haiti? What is the U.S. connection there? What needs to be done? And to understand that toys really are not going to solve the problem. But you don't want to quell, you don't want to sort of squelch their impulse to do something. What you want to do is make sure it doesn't stop with sympathy. And that's very difficult. It's very time consuming. It requires a lot of education. It requires a lot of commitment. It requires that you as a teacher or whoever you are working with these students have some understanding of that context and not just say, we raised, you know, we're sending toys to Haiti. Yay, they're all going to be so happy. Um, to get these toys, because that's a position grounded in sympathy. Mm -hmm. And that's so, what I'm trying to move beyond. Yeah, so maybe we could say that, you know, the difference between sympathy and empathy. Um, uh, yeah, the light's kind of shining on you. Yeah, kind of moving no, forward, we can won't have as much glare. Um, so with uh, with sympathy, it's... Uh, it's like the focus is on yourself. It's it, you're, right. you're seeing someone in pain. Mm -hmm. Right. We're, you're, I mean, empathy. I mean, I guess it kind of comes down to maybe we should have looked at the definition of empathy. But to start with, uh, but empathy uh, for me um, is well, maybe we should go into that a little bit of how are you defining empathy? And then we'll kind of uh, 
connect that to uh, sympathy? What what is kind of like your working definition of empathy? Well, I think there's there's different ways of, of looking at what I'm trying to do more broadly is to move education away from a definition of empathy that's only seeing it as a moral good and to understand it not just as a moral good, but it is something that is innate to all human beings and all animals um, to be able to understand the, the world from someone else's perspective, um, which does not mean that you have a hundred percent understanding. Um, do I have an understanding of what it is to be an African American man in this society? No, I never will have that perfect understanding, but that shouldn't prevent me from trying to see what I can see and to empathize. Um, because we really can't move forward as a world unless we can sort of admit, I can't see 100%, I can't understand 100%, but I have the biological capacity to get as close as I can get, and I'm going to try, and I'm going to keep trying um, to, to do that and to understand that. So it is the ability to put yourself in someone else's perspective and also to listen to someone else. For our students, I think that's a very important piece. It's just the listening to somebody whose perspective and experience is different from their own. Um, the surveys made very clear that they don't have that experience of having done that because they have such closed what I call moral circles. Their moral circles include their friends and their family, but they when they go outside of those very tight circles, they can only see sympathy. They can't see empathy. And that's because they haven't had that experience of actually talking to somebody and hearing their perspective and listening, listening quietly to how somebody else experiences the world. Um, you know, seeing pictures of poor starving children in Africa on your TV creates sympathy or after that earthquake in Haiti, it creates sympathy. But sympathy does not create change. Uh, and I don't think sympathy ever will create change. Sympathy creates charity. And my, so my sort of focus is, how do we move from a sympathy perspective to an empathy perspective? And I think the empathy perspective is where the, where the potential for change is more than in a sympathy perspective. Uh, real quickly, um, I might, maybe we could move your, uh, is it possible to move your, your uh, camera forward a little bit, uh, just so we can frame you a little bit better? Um, there? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, so uh, the way I've uh, d been defining empathy is kind of a four parts to mm -hmm. it. Uh, one is uh, self-empathy, which is uh, you know sensory awareness, mindfulness of what's going on inside of myself, like all the just uh, you know meditation is really good for that. Just Mm -hmm. Becoming aware of what's going on uh, physiologically within in myself. And then it's uh, the mirrored empathy is through mirror neurons, where mm -hmm. right. as I'm seeing you shake your head, you know, mm -hmm. the calmer, more spacious I am, the more I can reflect in right. the, the mirror neurons through mirrored mm -hmm. empathy, or sometimes called uh, affective empathy or mm -hmm. emotional empathy. Mm -hmm. Then there's the perspective taking part, which you've mentioned too, right. which is kind of taking the position. If I was in Haiti, all these situations were going on, you know, what would it be like kind of from an imaginative point of view? Mm -hmm. And then the uh, fourth part is empathic action, mm -hmm. which is, and I've seen that really play out in mediation where there's two parties who are really mad at each other, they're not connecting. You kind of empathize with them, you turn them to each other, get them to empathize with each other. They kind of find a point of connection. And from that point of connection, they start working together to uh, towards the future, like how they're going to change mm -hmm. the social, how they're going to change their relationship. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, a real creative uh, process kind mm -hmm. of in that. So that's all about, you know, connecting and really seeing the other person. Whereas with sympathy, it's like, oh, you're in pain. I feel sorry for you. And so it's kind of about yourself. Right. Uh, so that's kind of like the frame of, of how I kind of see that. It, it, does that kind of fit within? Yeah, it does. I mean, that's what I was talking about, needing to move students from sympathy, which is what comes to them naturally because that's how they've been socialized 
to interact with people who are different from themselves, um, to trying to move them to some sort of empathy and understanding the role of mirror neurons. Um, to me, the exciting thing about the research on mirror neurons is it, it pushes the, the conversation well past seeing empathy as a moral good, and it gives us a framework which you know Howard Zinn talked about 30, 40 years ago, to think about human beings as biologically capable of being much better than we are, um, and not believing sort of that humans are innately just competitive, uh, understanding that social Darwinism was you know was blown way out of proportion in order to justify capitalism and competition, and that there are other ways of seeing human relationships besides competition. Um, and for me, that's the important insight that education really needs to, to understand because thus far, empathy has only been seen as a moral, sort of like a moral good. Um, we should do it, it's good, but not something that shakes the very foundations of our society. And I think the current research really does shake the foundations of our society and says, we can do this differently and it's not just because we... Um, it's the right thing to do, but because this is who we are as human beings. Yeah, um, it's kind of, if you say moral, it's kind of like, a, is it, there's different moralities. It seems mm -hmm. there's two kind of moralities. One is based on empathy, of a feeling of empathy. And there seems to be another morality, which is kind of like a rules-based morality. Oh, right. And it's like, you must be nice, you know, be good, kind of, and this is the rule. And it's, it's kind of, is that, am I understanding that morality right? Right, because what it's saying is that we have what the rules based, you're, the one you're calling rules based, sort of says human beings are basically bad and evil and, you know, red in tooth and claw, just like nature. Um, but if we can rise above that through reason, okay, but we have lots of research now that shows that Descartes was wrong uh, and that Darwinism was overblown. And that we don't really need to be either, we don't really need to be overriding human nature in order to be empathic. We need to be tapping into the potentials of human nature in order to be more empathic. That it's there. It's not we're trying to stamp down the evil forces of that are in humans to become more cooperative. They're already there. We just have to nurture them and tap them in a different way than we have. And our society, the way it's currently structured through capitalism, takes us in a whole different direction. I mean, the whole premise of capitalism is that competition is innate and that people naturally want to compete with each other and dominate each other. And we have huge amounts of research now that show that is not the entire story and that people all also have a natural ability to cooperate um, and to work together and that that extends to animals nature is not red in tooth and claw all the way there are other forces happening too animals cooperate just as much as they compete um, and so all this research is showing us that we don't really need to appeal to morality we don't need to appeal to religion we just need to do a better job of nurturing what is within us, but that our current society has sort of stamped down and structured out by saying you must compete with other people, you must beat other people, there are scarce resources, there are limited resources, there aren't enough. Capitalism does that to us. And we need to have another way of of relating to people. And I think empathy provides that framework, that scaffolding for doing that. Yeah, so the the empathy is like the is like the new premise. That right. everything kind of gets built on. You can have right. a premise that everybody is greedy, selfish, self-interested, and you build a whole society kind of right. in a social structure on that. And it's like, hey, that's not the full picture. It's like empathy is also a human capacity. So now we have that as a new foundation. And let's build a social structure based on those premises. And right. I think that's what your book is really all about is saying here's it's going from this to that vision and you're kind of like making that the transition you know between the two
Right, that's exactly what I'm trying to do in the book and saying we have built an entire uh, entire social structure, an entire educational structure on some basic misconceptions about what it is to be human and what it is to be animal. And of course, humans are animals, but some very basic misconceptions about um, living beings. And we can build a different system, but we really need to look at the, what we're what we've built on and how we can rebuild things and that is a huge task and I think the first step has to be people understanding the research on empathy we didn't have this research 30 or 40 years ago we didn't have this research when the multicultural education field started in the 60s we didn't have this research during the civil rights movement um, Howard Zinn hinted at this research and he sort of drew the pieces together that he had access to um, but he didn't have access to this research, but we do. Um, and we need to build on and support that research and use that research to build a different social structure because we know we can now, that that's very possible. And, and the uh, foundation seems to be the two parts you're saying. I heard the cat there, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> is, um, is the one part is the whole mirror neurons, is right. the scientific uh, right. foundation uh, for empathy, as well as the animal studies like Franz de Waal right. and so right. forth. Right. So really, that's the kind of the underlying, uh, you know, is we're building this new foundation, this new culture of empathy, building this new social structure is those are seem to be real key kind of elements to, to this. They are. And Franz de Waal says that biology is our greatest hope. And I think we have to we have to latch on to that and look at biology as our hope um, and what we can sort of build a foundation on. Uh, Cornell West has spoken very eloquently about empathy for many years. Uh, but again, it's grounded in, more, in, a, in a more moral version of empathy. Um, whereas I think some of the new research like Franz de Waal and Mark Beckhoff has given us the, uh, the understanding that biology can be hope. It's not simply biology leads us in one way and as human beings we have to override that, which has been the message of religion and it's been re the message of morality, uh, that biology is our hope. And I think we have to build on that. And I think we have to do, we have to, you know, disseminate that research much more broadly and get people to see that because the path we're going down is obviously one of destruction. Um, you know, we have uh, climate change, we have global warming, we have factory farming, we have, you know, all these systemic things that have not been around very long. I mean, factory farming has only been around for about 60 years or so, but have done huge amounts of devastation to the planet. And so we have to do a better job of really trying to shift the, the framework, to shift the foundation of the conversation much more quickly than we've, been, when we've done it. And we have the research to show that it's possible to shift that that framework of the foundation of our of our society and we have to do it now we have to do it very quickly we don't have 200 years to do it we have a couple decades and okay so we've kind of laid the foundation here so what are you seeing as kind of the steps to get to to this what are some more of the uh, steps from kind of where we are you know we've got we've got the mirror neurons we've got that and so how are we going to change the education system? I mean, one thing is, is, <laughs> is writing about it. It's like after I read, after I came back from that uh, event that I went to, mm -hmm. I thought your book was just what I needed to give to the, to the people mm -hmm. there. It's mm -hmm. like, here's the map. You know, you've done this map and you, you and it would have, you know, I could have talked and talked and talked there, but it was like, just show them your book. It would have kind of really helped move the conversation, I think, there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't say it's going to be easy in education. People are very invested in paradigms that have been around for a long time. Um, I am heartened that the book has gotten a fairly good response so far. It's only been available for a few weeks. It's gotten a good response. Um, there are some other people doing some work on empathy. We have to do more of it. We have to be a lot more vocal about the work on empathy. We have to, you know, sort of get it disseminated much more broadly. Um, I'm, cer I'm certainly heartened by the Occupy movement, even though, you know, I don't think it's really come to fruition in the way that it could. It's a very hopeful sign. I think there are signs out there that things are changing. Um, 
Keystone is not happening. I mean, you know, 350.org is doing fabulous work trying to stop some of these things. Um, so I think there is, there's a lot of work going on around trying to scale back factory farming. Um, there was an editorial in my local paper, or actually an op-ed, in defense of factory farming and sort of attacking organic food and attacking the environmental sustainability movement which to me said that even in such a conservative area as the Midwest of Indiana, that things are starting to change if people who do factory farming feeling like they have to defend what they do. My local farmer's market here has grown incredibly since we've been here. You know, it just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. Um, we need to move these conversations past sort of the, you know, beyond sort of just the elite intellectuals who have these conversations um, so that everybody understands, you know, why they should not support factory farming, why they should support their local farmer's market. Um, it makes perfect sense. You're supporting somebody, your neighbor. You know, you're buying from your neighbor as opposed to buying from Walmart. You're getting out. You're seeing the community. You're making connections with people. You're buying eggs from chickens who haven't been abused in the process. Um, and you're supporting the local economy. We have to do a better job of making, uh, making these things easy and accessible to people who are not just sort of part of the intelligentsia class, but a, a broader frame of people. Yes, we need to find ways of getting all of society kind of involved and and uh, how do we kind of get them involved is what I'm looking at. Even it's also um, like I, I've been to the Tea Party rallies, to the Democratic Convention, to the Republican State Convention, and I've talked in the Occupy. We even had an Occupy, I mean, an empathy tent that the local yeah. Berkeley yeah. occupied yeah. here. So... What I found is that the way to get to a culture of empathy is to empathize, mm -hmm. right? It's like we're not going to get to a culture of empathy through analysis, through judgment, you know, through demeaning, you know, through put downs. And so we need to go. And even, you know, there's like conservatives, you know, a lot of times, you know, progressives say, well, conservatives are the people keeping us from empathizing. Whereas it seems to me we need to go and empathize with conservatives. We need to empathize with uh, progressives. Um, do you know what I mean? It's like the, the means are the end somehow to get that yeah. message out. Yeah, that's and, true. And I, and I live in a relatively conservative community in the Midwest. And so, um, you know, many of my neighbors, my friends, uh, the colleagues, people I work with, um, you know, people come from a wide spectrum of political beliefs. Um, and people find points of connection, um, whether it's just, you know, sort of sharing a lawnmower with our neighbor who we have nothing else really in common with, and then sharing a drink together after the lawns are mowed. Building those connections are very important and not to sort of live in ivory towers and not to just live at our universities, and in, but to really be part of our communities is very mm. important. Um, I volunteer at our local animal shelter. I meet people from all walks of life there. I have volunteered at other organizations. We're at the farmer's market every Saturday morning in the season. Uh, we do a lot of community things. We don't, you know, I live in a neighborhood. I don't live in a academic neighborhood. I live in a regular neighborhood with people that have regular jobs. Um, it, and so it, when you do that, when your life revolves around just sort of not around the, you know, just sort of the university and getting on a plane to go give talks every, you know, once a week, um, you, you do get a different sense of how to live your life and empathy becomes part of that because these are the people you connect with. The other parents at school, these are not people that I would agree with everything on, but we find points of connection and through that, hopefully expand people's perspectives. Uh, one of our one of our good friends, I mean, they really had very little understanding, great progressive politics, you know, um, very little understanding of animals um, and the importance of animals in our lives. But through spending time 
with myself and my husband and my family over the past couple of years, they have a much greater appreciation of animals. And when our cat died actually last summer, I actually gave a donation to the animal shelter for the first time in their life. So under so beginning to sort of just expand people's horizons a little bit beyond traditional progressive politics to a larger frame of understanding your life. I think we're getting a lot of sun now. Yeah, we're getting, you're kind of getting overexposed yeah. here. So we it's might, uh, two o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, we might uh, bring it to a close. We can always pick this up at another point in time um, if you're up for that. Because I think yeah, there's sure. a lot, there's a lot to uh, talk about here. Yeah, and, we have lots of pages and notes here still. So sure. Yeah. Um, because I guess I just love your book and I think it's so, it's a, it's a really important, uh, you know, book and, um, and also you're very articulate and you've, you know, you've, you're, so I'm really, really looking forward to talking more about this, maybe doing some panels, getting some uh, discussions going. And this whole thing that you're talking about, too, of academics, you know, get down from the ivory, ivory tower. And, you know, that's, there, that's a whole nother uh, topic, too. You know, it is. It's like it's like it, you know, I, don't, I could go on and on. Here, but So I, I will. Is there any. Just to kind of bring it to this to a close, since we're kind of having the problem with the light here, um, is there any kind of wrap up that you'd like to do? Um, well, let me think. I guess we, you know, we didn't we didn't talk. Uh, um, I think we covered a lot of things actually. Well, one of the things that I really, I, one of the things I really did want to talk about, and I see it in my students all the time, is we need to work with people more to help them understand the ways that they can produce positive change. Um, because I think a lot of people do feel powerless in the system and the Occupy movement brought attention to that. But the reality is that the Occupy movement, I mean, I couldn't go to those events. They were, I have a small child, I have a job, I have all sorts of things. I, I can't right now go live at the Indianapolis State House. It's just not a possibility. And I have a very flexible life. Um, and I have a very privileged life compared to most people who have, you know, I don't know how, I really don't know how regular people manage. You have two jobs and small children and can't afford daycare and just the constant juggling. Um, we have to do a better job of working with people to help them understand the way that they can they can be a positive force for change. Because I see in my students all the time that even if there's a spark there, they're like, well, what can I do? I can't do anything. I'm only one person. And then that spark goes out very quickly. And I think Marshall Gantz at um, the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard is doing fabulous work with his, with his work on public narrative to get people to understand how to expand from the story of me to the story of us to the story of now, which is really empathy. I mean, it really is empathy starting with who I am and then making those connections to the larger community and then through the story of now how to make change. Um, we really need to do a better job of doing that and it doesn't need to be huge political change. Um, it can be sort of forming neighborhood associations and spending more time with your neighbors and shutting off the TV and spending less time on Facebook. You know there's all this Cheryl Turkle's work on alone together and how social networking really is contributing to the problems of isolation as opposed to bringing us together. So we need more human connections and human, just that basic idea of human connection um, can lead people to understanding how they can make positive change in their world with or without their iPhone. Well, um, <clears throat> great, then uh, we'll leave that. It and uh, at this, at that, uh, with those insights, and uh, look to kind of pick it up again. And because this is okay. this is this is really a movement. I, I <laughs> see it. It's it's not like oh, we just you know we just say this and then it ends. It's like this mm -hmm. is for me. It's a lifelong, uh, you know, movement to you know transform uh, you know world culture and society. And I think we're just at the you know at the beginning stages of it. And we, we are at the beginning, but there clearly is a sense of ur urgency because things like, um, you know, global warming and climate change are happening right now and they predominantly affect poor people. 
Um, and those sort of things need to be, we don't have 200 years. We just have a matter of a very short amount of time before some of these changes are irreversible. So I, I, I do think that there's a real sense of urgency behind this work and getting it out as quickly as possible and getting people to see how change is possible. A lot of people may not understand that, you know, the neuroscience or the primatology or all the other work that's been done, but if they can begin to understand how they can produce change in their life just by instead of getting in their car and going to the Walmart, they're just taking a walk down to the farmer's market, that's a step. And the more steps we can take, the better. So we really got to make this happen. We got to start really working hard at it. So mm -hmm. I'm all for that because that's <laughs> so. Well, Thank it's been it's a real pleasure. I mean, it's, it's just to talk uh, to you. I'm just so excited about uh, the work you're doing and and the chance to talk to you about this and yes, future we'll steps. Soon. Okay. Thanks uh, a lot. Care. You bye. too. Bye bye. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.